easier. But anyways, uh, I want to welcome everybody here to uh, our first uh, SAM Next uh, Zoom uh, discussion. We decided to have these just recently. Our department talked about this offline and said, you know what, we have so many students out there and alumni and, and folks in general that are just not sure of a lot of things in our industry and for the uh, benefit of our uh, panelists, which we'll talk to in a second, you know, our major is sports arts and entertainment management. So, you know, we're right there with something that's probably coming back uh, last. And so we wanna, you know, kind of reassure our students, uh, especially those that have just graduated or those that have been furloughed that, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. It's just that we're going through a period. So we're trying to be positive, but yet be realistic. So uh, this is our first one. Uh, next week we will be doing one on ticketing and then we have one on arts and et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk more about that. Uh, I'm sure most of the folks that are our students, I know they know me, but there's other folks that uh, maybe do not because they're not all just Point Park. So my name's Ed Traversary and I'm gonna be your moderator today. Um, I've been at Point Park now as a professor for actually almost 13 years. Um, never knew it was coming. Uh, my background is being a concert promoter. I work for a local company here in Pittsburgh that most of you won't know the name because you're not old enough, but uh, it was two guys, the Caesar Engler Productions. Um, as I've talked to you guys, mostly in our classes, every city had a major concert promoter throughout the 70s and 80s before we all wrapped up uh, at that point into Live Nation. And we were just one of those in Pittsburgh. So I, I did all of that for about 35 years. And uh, then I realized that uh, Point Park had the major at that time called Sports Arts and Entertainment Management. And uh, I made some calls and before you know it, they said, if you want to come over and help run the entertainment program, let's get started. So I did. and. Uh, we actually sold our company to Live Nation at the uh, towards the end of my time, and it was fine. Everything was good, but uh, it was just a little bit time to move on. And I thought it'd be a good time to give back because there's not a lot of universities that teach entertainment management. We happen to have, uh, you know, Kevin Lyman will speak to us in a minute. He's teaching at USC as well as, of course, creating the Warp Tour and doing all the other things he does. Uh, but I also wanted to mention just before we go on too much further, the rest of our staff who's on this uh, call today would be uh, Bob Durda, Paige Bill, Teresa Gregory, uh, Kendra Ross, and Jason Varnish. Those folks are all gonna be speaking later uh, on each one of the different subjects uh, that we have. We're all kind of taking our forte and going out and finding a panel. Um, before we actually go further with that, I wanted to introduce our co-moderator. Uh, she's one of our SAM students and former president of the Sports Arts and Entertainment Management Club, and that's Christy Martin. Christy, hello. Uh, Christy is going to uh, give us a little housekeeping, some things that everybody should know, maybe in terms of asking questions and mute and things like that. So Christy, you want to give them the background there? We will in a second. There she goes. She's Christy? She's still on mute. Someone has to unmute her. Yeah. You unmuting, Christy? Um, I thought she was unmuted, but I'll, I'll go back. Sorry, Christy. That's all right. Okay. Let's see if she can try now. Christy. There you go, Christy. All right. There we go. Hurry. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for those kind words, Ed. Um, and I just wanted to let you all know a few things here before we get started. So I wanted to point out the bottom right corner chat option. So if you would like to, please say hi and let us know where you all are from. And if you have any questions, we would love for you all to type them in the chat and we will be sure to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the session. And if you previously emailed in questions, please e uh, type them in again at the chat so that we can make sure to get all those questions in at the end. Also, we wanted to let you all know that this meeting is being recorded. So if your video screen is up, you know, think twice <laughs> what you're doing um, because it will be recorded. But also the good news is that if you really enjoyed the session and want to watch it again or refer it to a friend, 
this will be accessible on the SAEM Next page at pointpark.edu forward slash SAEM Next. And also it will be on SAEM's YouTube channel. And as you may have noticed when you logged on to the session, you all are muted. So this is in the interest of making sure that the audio quality is good for everyone. So you will not be able to unmute yourselves. And again, we please ask that you will use the question um, option by using the chat in the bottom right hand corner. We would love to hear all of your questions and we will try and address as many of them as we can at the end of the session. And lastly, like Ed said, please join us again next week for our session on ticketing. It will be one that you will not want to miss. And I'll give it back to Ed. Excellent, Christy. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, next, before we move on to our panelists, I also wanted to uh, introduce Bob Durda. Bob's our department chair of the program, and he had a few things he was going to mention. So, Bob. Oh, thanks, Ed. Yep. And by the way, Ed, can you imagine them trying to mute either one of us? No. No. Yeah, no, no. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I just wanted to uh, point out, um, you know, so this SAM Next is our first session, as Ed said, uh, with a focus on music. Um, it's important to note here at the beginning of the session, I think that during these challenging times facing the country, um, the really sports arts and the sports arts and entertainment industry has really stepped forward um, and has made a stand against racism and against police brutality. And you know, I, I'm sure all of us have read how uh, Warner Music Group and Sony Music and others. Um, went silent yesterday on social media. Uh, I think we, I, I read somewhere that MTV um, went dark for eight minutes and 46 seconds in respect um, for George Floyd. And so uh, I think it's significant that, um, and maybe we can talk Ed at some point during the session today about really how the music industry has stepped forward uh, to take a stand. So that's it. Thank you everyone for joining us and Ed, I'll throw it back to you. Okay. Good. Let's get on to the panel. Um, let's start with Morgan Nicholson. Morgan is the uh, Director of Marketing here in Pittsburgh, Live Nation. Uh, she uh, does uh, all the marketing for all their venues here. She uh, does the s and uh, Bank uh, uh, Music Park, uh, which is our course for us old folks. It's the Star Lake. I know that Stuart and Kevin... Through the introduction. Okay. Hey. <laughs> okay, I can hear you. Good. Kevin Lyman's here with us. Kevin uh, is, of course, the creator, uh, producer of the Warp Tour, which, you know, most of all of our students certainly know that. Plus, he has all of his uh, other companies and productions that he does, and we'll talk about that in a second. And I really appreciate him coming on. He's been uh, a fantastic friend friend over the years, uh, going all the way back to coming into Station Square and doing the first Warp Tour. And he's seen our students out at the lake and just, he's done all great things. Plus, he's giving back wonderfully now because, as I mentioned, and if you missed it, he's teaching six classes in entertainment at USC. So uh, we appreciate you coming on, Kev. Really Thank do. you. Thank you. Uh, also, yep, Stuart Ross. Uh, Again, very happy that Stuart agreed to come on. Uh, Stuart works for Red Light Management, mm -hmm. uh, biggest management company I'm sure in the world. Uh, they have several offices across the United States. Uh, they manage lots of bands. Um, many of us know that it started, I believe, mostly with Dave Matthews and it just went from there and they have so many acts. And Stuart's been a great friend. And I'll also mention just real quick on Stuart that he's a, uh, He's always joining us out at Polestar, just like Kevin is. And it's been so great because uh, a sidebar story that I've told in my classes, one of uh, my interns at DeCesar Engler many, many, many moons ago uh, wanted to learn production. And uh, we had sent her out to Star Lake and work under a guy named Gary Hinston. And Stuart back then was with Lollapalooza. And uh, he helped take her under his wing and through his mentoring, and I really mean that, he, she's done a number of things. We'll, we'll probably talk about it again, but right now uh, she is the VP of Legal Affairs for Live Nation Global Touring in LA. 
And, you know, when we get together at Polestar and he gets to, she tells the story to the students in that, it's a wonderful time. And I know that some of the kids on this call were actually in that meeting that we had out there. So Stuart, we really appreciate you getting up this morning and coming on. Yeah, okay. Stuart needs unmuted. All right, okay. I'm gonna move on to some questions here. Uh, any right. guys, I'm sorry. Stuart, are you okay there? All right, good. Stuart's still on mute. They got uh, I've seen, uh, hold on, we're gonna get Stuart unmuted. Oh, hold here. on, let me get him unmuted, sorry. Okay, no problem. Guys, this is our first round at this rodeo. We're so. working out the kinks, you got it. We are. Okay. Okay, I'm on. Right. Hey, Stuart, guys. Okay, good. All right. Hey, Ed, so we did all Ed, the let me ask you a question. <laughs> Please. Let me ask you a question. Did Kevin and I open Star Lake with Lollapalooza? It was, no, it was Billy Joel was the oh, okay. opener 31 years ago. <laughs> okay, for the, for the sake yeah. of this... Uh, class. We'll say we did. Let's we'll pretend. Yeah, I was, I was going to say you did, and I was going to tell Morgan later, we know it was Billy Joel, because we remember all the darn traffic. We and you did that say that it was night. recorded, so I don't want it coming back to haunt me. <laughs> okay. Did Kevin oh, and I open funny. Star Lake for the first show that did damage? Yeah. Or the first exclusive I, festival. Let's do that. We'll keep it with that. Oh, uh, no, but we, you know, and we could talk so much. I think most of the folks would just like some of these background stories, honestly, but, uh, and again, I'll just mention with uh, Warp Tour, once again, let's go over to there with all the shows that, and Kevin, you've come to every Warp Tour, I'm sure, in Pittsburgh, because you travel all the time with them, is that correct? Yeah, I uh, learned early in life that it was best for me to be at every show. Uh, you did. I did a little thing yesterday where, very early in the tour, I thought I could fly home for a day, and my crew, I, it got a little wild, I'll just say. Warp Tour was always a little right on the edge. We had a, you know, a few things, but right. in those early days, we were pretty much a band of pirates, and uh, I, you needed, a, you needed a, a, someone there to control the chaos. So I never left the show after, in 1996, or I left for one day, and I never left again. So I was at every show. So. That's awesome. Is that it? Thumbs up. Are you hearing me? I just want to make sure it's my yeah. connections. Okay. My connections. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You guys. Okay. I hear you. Okay. Ed might be having theater, which was a parking lot. And uh, that's where Warped went for, well, several years until we couldn't stick one more person in there. And then we had to make the move out to the big venue, right? Yeah, we would play, you know, I think that that last year down down by the river there, I mean, we had stages on top of stages and people on top of people. So exactly. we decided to make the move and, oh and, it, and it always seemed to work there. And I always enjoyed going. It was my one time to get to slip back and go fishing in that little boat you had. Right. So I, I, I love, love the water out there. It was one of my, Nelson Pond. Yeah, it was one of my favorite, from one of my, our favorite places. And then golfing with Shag and hitting golf balls in the back was yeah. always fun. And Stuart, you with Lollapalooza, I mean, that was, I mean, what year was that 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 tour happened? It started in 1991 and it ended in 1997. Now in 91, were there any other festivals that were traveling through amphitheaters at that time? There were a few. Uh, there was one that Peter Gabriel was involved with called WOMAD. Right. I remember. And it was, as it is now, uh, world music based mm -hmm. and then there was another festival and kevin help me out on this that uh the cult were involved in oh back in the very early 90s do you remember this no i don't remember the name Stuart. i'm sorry but, but anyway yeah. yes uh Lollapalooza was the first kind of major scale traveling festival you know, and we have a lot of students on here uh, and alumni that are going to be in our industry sometime. And I'll be frank with you, we have a lot of young women. Uh, and maybe just briefly, uh, not to go on too long, but the situation with, with, uh, with Kelly was very important as to what she did. And how did that come to be with her? And what did you see in her as a uh, young, she was a Pitt student at the time that you were able to uh, help her with? Well, I first met Kelly in the 80s because I had um, I had taken a, a job as the tour manager 
for the late singer songwriter Warren Zevon. Right. And I loved Warren and I was honored to be asked to do this job. And we played the small venue underneath the Syria Mosque that? Ballroom. Syria Mosque. Mosque Ballroom. Underneath okay. the Syria Mosque. You got to be old on this call to know that or ask your parents, everybody. <laughs> and uh, Kelly was the promoter rep. Right. And she was, I think, 18. And she said, I'm leaving and I'm going to go to California. And I said, well, look me up. And she actually did. And she was working in a bakery at the time in a muffin shop. And I, I, she wanted to stay in the industry. And like I say to a lot of people who want to get in the industry, learn box office, learn how the money comes in. And she got a job at the Wiltern Theater and eventually got into the box office. And, uh, uh, you know, she had upward career growth from that point forward. On Lollapalooza, she worked with me. And, you know, even though it was a legendary festival, it didn't have the world's largest staff of people, not anything like what happens today. Mm -hmm. And Kelly did box office and marketing. Imagine this, right? Mm -hmm. That one person would share both those jobs because it's usually at least two people for that. And, uh, and that was in the day when marketing was print ads and radio. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of work and, uh, she killed it and decided to go to law school at night while she was working on uh, pre-production for Lollapalooza graduated and, you know, She's had a great career path. She sure has. And you're exactly right. And she always explains to me, too, that, you know, she wanted to learn the production side of it, which at the time was probably more male dominated. And she wanted to learn how to ride a forklift and how to take care of uh, electrical power. And so, you know, these jobs are now available. I mean, as you guys see that, I know, Kevin, when I was, I remember the last time that you and I were together out at uh, the amphitheater and you spoke to our students you asked us if we wanted to meet some of your staff. And I, of course, said, yeah, let's go. And if I remember right, six of the eight people I met were mostly women, young girls, whatever the case might be. Absolutely, Ed. Um, you know, and I was, I, that was my first tour, Lollapalooza in 1991. I was a stage manager for, on that tour. Um, it was the first time I'd ever been on the road, so after 12 and a half years. Um, uh, yeah, no, I have always worked well and, Work and our, our complete production staff were women on the warp tour, except for Carrie Nicholson and our head of security. So the actual core production staff was always, uh, and that's what kind of you know. I know Kelly touring with her back when I was on Lollapalooza. I mean, I don't think we had, I think we had two or three women on that whole tour, if I remember correctly, Stuart, um, and, and working in the, um, mm -hmm. in, in the tour. And now you will go out, especially in the festival realm and, and, and that. But a lot of my people would work, go spin off and go work festivals in the fall and the, and the spring. And they would start sucking along younger people. And, and, you know, as I see young women here, it's very similar to my classes at USC. I mean, uh, my staff that just produced the 320 festival that we had to put pivot online a few weeks ago for mental health. Um, it was interesting. Um, 19 of the 20 people who worked on that with me were, were female uh, and women that were strong in the business. So um, I think it's an equal playing field. And then in the production world, it's grown even more that we, on our last tour, 25% uh, of our sound crew were women. So some of those jobs that you would not particularly see, right. you know, maybe in the production office have now spun into more of those jobs that were definitely male dominated. Mm -hmm. Those doors are now open. And you know you have to think the music business isn't that old, really. So it's right. we're sec we're about third gener second we're entering our third generation of, of women in the business really right now. Right, right. And, and uh, so there's a lot point. of doors open right now. Good points. And and lastly, before we go into the questions, Morgan, I know you and I have only got a chance to meet the last couple of years, but and I know what you've done more recently. But you you've actually you didn't start as a marketer in a promoter company. Is is that correct? You started with radio, was it? Yeah, I started. Yep. 
at a one just out of college, I started as a, um, an intern at a radio station doing promotions. I was the person, you know, setting up at concerts. Um, I was trying to give Warped Tour tickets away at a third party, you know, concert yeah. or bar, you know. Yep. Um, and then um, through my alumni association, I was referred to uh, Live Nation Detroit, um, where I worked there as a marketing assistant. And, you know, kind of you know, as, as Stuart was talking about, whenever people open up their doors and they say, hey, connect with me, reach out to me, and you actually do, that's, that's the path um, less traveled. I mean, I did that my entire career. That's why I was able to um, kind of see all facets of Live Nation. So I was able to do um, the marketing assistant realm, learning from a mentor, and then I was able to um, experience the Fillmore's that are in our company portfolio and our clubs and theaters division. I was able to open a new venue in Raleigh. And then I did flip to um, Country Nation um, in Nashville. I, I did major festivals across the country from Faster Horses to Watershed to Route 91 in Vegas. So, um, and then I got the call to come home and uh, here I am in Pittsburgh, <laughs> living out my Yinzer dreams. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good uh, track. No, I mean, it really is because you know, you usually can't get necessary to that first job right away that everybody wants, but you went and you made some great contacts and, right. uh, you know, you worked across the country and your experience has now proven that, you know, uh, you're doing it here in Pittsburgh. And I'm sure this has been crazy for you because probably when this all came down in early March, you were starting to go up with a ton of shows, I'll bet. We were already, we were already there. I mean, I've been putting shows on sale since October. Um, yeah. So I think we had probably... 90% of our season was on sale. Um, so we were, but we were in that period, you know, where we're, we're in the thick of it. We're getting ready for National Concert Week, our $20 ticket promotions. And we're, you know, kind of teeing up all of our, our major spend that comes um, through marketing in the, in the last, you know, 60 to 90 days. Uh, so. And then they put the brakes on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they it's been, it's been crazy to press that pause button um, in certain ways. And with all that in mind, guys, I'm glad, that's a great background. Thank you for all of that. I, I think, you know, most of the questions that we get, I'm sure, are not anything different than what you've already heard. And I know that, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, as we all say, but we know with your experience, all three of you, it's more than all of us that have, especially with what's going on today. You know, what we hear a lot is after COVID-19 came in, we understand it. Now everybody's wondering when we can get back. Everybody wants to say, when's it going to be normal? And, you know, there's not a new normal and et cetera. But I guess what I wanted to open up for anyone uh, right now is uh, when do we think it'll come back and how will it come back and what are the implications of it coming back? It won't be quite as simple as just when a band gets sick and you're rescheduling. We know that's not the way this is working. So, we wanted to get your feedback. Maybe we can start with you, Stuart, to keep it uh, straight so we'll get answers from each of you. I have no idea. When is it really going to come back? Mm -hmm. uh, when is it really going to come back like it was in the good old days of 2019? Mm -hmm. When we have a vaccine. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, you yep. know? Yep. I mean, there's, uh, besides rules and laws, there's going to be a good portion of people who are not going to want to be in a crowded room. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a good portion of entertainers that are not going to want to, you know, take that risk. And, but, you know, uh, I'm following the sports model and waiting to see what they do because the sports teams in my mind are really our landlords mm -hmm. in the arena circuit. And they're going to, uh, you know, we're watching them very carefully. Sure. When they come back, we come back. Yeah. But there's a lot of smart people out there in the concert industry and top production people who are trying to figure out ways to creative ways to do um, uh, social distancing at arena shows and it's interesting i mean i don't know how it's going to work out because there's an awful lot of parts to it so you know i think it's going to be a while but i think you're going to start to see concerts uh, on a limited basis not you know late fall maybe i don't know 
Mm -hmm. I got you. It may be uh, something maybe smaller. Do you think that the reserve seat houses will start a little quicker than the GA houses? So yes, without question. Mm -hmm. Because in a reserve seat house, you can actually do social distancing. Mm -hmm. I mean, are people going to want to go to a seated show where the person next to you is six feet away and the person behind you is six feet away? It's it's going to look a little weird. And financially, I don't know if uh, if the numbers are going to support that. Right. I mean, we're going to have to see because everybody's going to have to come to terms if that's true. And if you're playing to one third houses, mm -hmm. are people going to want to play and can they afford to play a 3000 seat hall with a thousand people? or a 15,000 seat hall with 5,000 people. Typically, if you're an act and you go into an arena and you've sold 5,000 tickets, it's a failure. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be complicated and very sensitive. Plus, we don't know on the other side, how are the acts gonna handle this? Right. Right? Are we still going to put 12 people in a bus? Right. in an enclosed air recirculating system. I mean, these are, these are a lot of things we're trying to figure out. But if nothing else, shows are going to get smaller. People yeah. are not going to carry as much production because income is going to be cut. Right, right, exactly. That makes, that's what I'm hearing too on many of the calls. And, you know, I know, Kevin, with you doing so much production, I mean, you're a perfect one to talk to in terms of, tour buses, you know, you can't afford to put one or two people on a tour bus, I don't think. I mean, you don't have that kind of money. And will production people want to be living with 12 folks on tour buses and, and hotels? I don't know. But what do you think? Well, I, I, I mean, if I was, if I was, I'm putting myself in the student shoes right now, because um, there's a lot of, you know, discussion. I worked on the Event Safety Alliance manual and things like that. But if I was a student right now, I would be looking at the 10% of people who will not be coming back to concerts, okay? Um, I believe that 10% of the population is not coming back to concerts. They've just, it's, the, the dynamics have changed. So if I was a student, one of you guys sitting out there right now, I'd start looking at technology and some of the things that will capture, because this is a moment in time where a lot of things that were ignored, a lot of people, because you have to realize, and, and towards managers, the management companies that I've talked to, and I've talked to everyone, everyone calls me all day long. I finally had to turn off my phone the last couple of weeks just to kind of chill. <laughs> but 65 to 70% of all money revenues for a lot of management company was coming from the live space. Mm -hmm. So if you're going in the live world, you know, that was where the money's coming in and you're constantly trying to generate that money. So we became so live focused that we ignored all these kind of things that were looked at like, as fringe revenue streams. Mm -hmm. So once you pulled the rug out and touring went away like overnight, it was just like, it was literally within a week. A lot of people were saying F Kevin Lyman because I was very vocal that I said, it's going away. I, you know, I, I did some articles right away and, and I have friends who call me Danny Wimmer and those guys going, when you said that festivals were gonna get canceled this year, we're like F Kevin Lyman and five days later we're canceled. I don't wanna be right, but mm -hmm. it was like, if I were you, I'd be looking at companies that are, you know, our management companies didn't have time to take a call from a company like Veeps or Topeka Live or Cameo or some of these things. It's amazing because I'm an investor in many of these companies, how the growth in those businesses has, has you know, a company like Veeps that was kind of an online artist controlled VIP system that was kept getting a little momentum because it was all controlled by an artist. There was no fees. You didn't have to pay a, a, a CID or VI, VIP nation. Had about 200 bands in March. They were able to pivot through technology to build a paywall for artists overnight. It was that quick. They now have over 800 bands using their platform and learning how to monetize special events and situations. Well, Will they exist? I think they're one, one people will pivot to them on a VIP platform much easier now, but they're really doing well. I mean, they did a, a Brandy Carlisle event the other night that, that generated $100,000. Um, you know, a band like Dirty Heads is doing a special thing every couple of weeks for their fans where it's $10. So it's $10 that goes to the band and a 15% service fee. So $1.50 goes to Veeps. 
-hmm. Dirty Heads manages their whole system. They play a, an album every two weeks in its entirety. They, the band generated $30,000 for themselves. So for the mental health of artists to not have to be on the road as long as they are forced to be, I think artists are gonna start looking at this going, you know what, if we could generate, you know, they've done three of them, which generated right around $80,000 so far. They can look at that revenue and say, you know what, we don't need to go on a road. This, that's a couple less weeks, two, three less weeks on the road as artists that we have to be out next year. So there's so many layers to this and I don't wanna hog the thing, but all day long I go through this. So if I was, you know, I would be looking at the technology side because you know what, every one of these management companies, once they do get up and running and touring, are going to want a young person that totally understands technology to come in and help manage all these platforms for them. I know artists that are generating thousands of dollars a week on Cameo right now. They thought it was maybe a little weird at first, mm -hmm. but now they're like, wait, this is another, I can sit in my house and make a grand today? That's kind of cool. I, yeah, you said it great, and I'm sure we all would agree with that. And that was actually another question coming up, so I'm glad you brought it up because exactly we have, as a staff, have been talking about that, saying that, you know, we may even look to, to, to be teaching some classes a little differently than we taught before because it's very, you know, traditional and et cetera, but we want to stay on the cutting edge. And, uh, and I would think, and in, in, in again, I'm thinking of Morgan there, you know, she's had some of our uh, interns over there. She's actually had one of our one of our students as an employee uh, in marketing, but you probably would encourage to have some young students just coming out of school with some brand new technological capacity because your boss could say, we're going to do this, Morgan, and you're going, okay, good. Let me have yeah. some help. <laughs> I mean, I'm not making TikTok videos. I won't, right. you know, um, and I still have that pipe dream of the Portlandia episode where they send their drones to a festival because they're too old to go to a festival and stand all day. You know, like how do we recreate that experience, right? Um, but I think, you know, through the live space and what we've been discussing, you know, Live Nation's in over a hundred countries and Denmark started the, the drive-in concerts. I know that that's been kind of what you guys have been seeing everywhere. I know the chat is chiming with um, Keith Urban um, and that example in Nashville. And, you know, it's just kind of understanding what that platform is. I think right now it gives us light and excitement um, but just know that that was invite only. That was for Vanderbilt nurses. That was only 300 people, very exclusive. Um, and, but that did give us the platform to see, you know, how do you queue cars? How, you know, what's, what's the restroom line look? Like, are people allowed to bring their own food and beverage to this concert, which historically has been our ancillary revenue. We want to be able to sell you a beer. Um, but at the same time, you know, we always put safety first in the concert space. Um, and another thing, you know, we launched live from home the first week, which was a culmination of all of the live streaming that was happening throughout the internet. So you can go to livenation.com backslash live from home and it's all right there at your fingertips. And this is anything from if Donnie Iris calls me tonight and he wants to go live in his living room, I can put that up on the Live Nation space. It's not anything exclusive to our touring artists, it's everybody, um, you know, or, as we've talked about socially distanced concerts. So that's on a lot of our calls right now. It's, you know, a lot of people are saying that open air, they want to be in an open air venue, not in an arena right now. Um, so can we do a limited capacity seated lawn? You know, we've had the reserve lawn section. How do we expand that? How do you move the stage forward? You know, can you tap into our, you know, new venue screens? things of that nature. So we're definitely, you know, box office, Jason, I don't want to steal your thunder for next week, but you know, they're working, they're working really hard on technology on how to queue lines um, to get people to come staggered through the doors um, and what seat maps look like, you know, with six feet behind you and six feet to either side and behind you. But, you know, somebody chimed in, it's, it's not the same as being live and all together. Um, you know, and sweating on the person next to you and bumping elbows with them, loving your favorite song. Um, but we'll get there eventually. It's just going to take time, just like everything else. So Those are all great points, you know, and it seems to me that, uh, as I noticed, Live Nation did jump 
into this quite quickly because of course having so many venues and so many people that work for them and i mean you know basically the biggest promoter in the world it seemed like they were uh on the cutting edge of all these ideas you just mentioned mm -hmm. so i think yeah and we try to be and we were also the first people to say hey safety first like we're working from home we're pulling our artists off the road like we have to we have to make sure that everybody's safe that's our number one priority and then and then we survey people you know what does make everyone on this call safe to walk into a concert space again you know and they're saying it's sanitizer it's limited capacity it's an outdoor setting it's everybody wearing masks so then how do we how do we work with local governments um to be able to do that again so and that's those are the conversations that we've never we never had to have in depth but that we're we're getting to do that. It's the same thing as connecting with all of you people on the phone. You know, I don't know if I would have been sitting here if it weren't for this situation. So it's something remarkable about that. So. Well, exactly, and that goes to Kevin's point too about you know what the students should be looking for, and that's exactly what we're telling them the same thing. You know, perhaps you know be looking for these new things because at some point when it does go back or get stronger, there could be quite an influx of opportunity, but it could be a different opportunity than just your traditional role that we play. But I wanted to mention something to Stuart here. I mean, you know, this Stuart is in the management company. So again, just my own experience is it's going to come down to the managers to decide when they want to let the bands or when the band wants to tour. Are you hearing, I mean, I know, you know, we don't talk about what the bands are saying, but they're willing and ready maybe to go if they feel comfortable is that the type of thing that i guess would have to be for them well there's a lot there's a lot of dynamics going on yeah. here i mean artists the same as the staff the same as the managers are, are really and and most of the united states is uh is dealing with a real hit on their income and so everybody wants to go back to work as soon as possible. Obviously, there's a lot of layers on when we're going to be able to go back to work. But we're, as managers, we are looking for every opportunity we can to get our clients to earn some money. Because, yes, a big portion of our income is from touring. It's not from record sales which you know 20 years ago that's that's where it came from now uh you know kevin brought up veeps veeps is an incredible platform one of my artists you know is doing a five show series on veeps and <clears throat> man it's that's solid stuff right there mm -hmm. um it's Stuart. we're just real quick veeps was created by a young woman named sherry saidi I mean, she's 26, 27 years old now. So just- I've been on the phone with her, yeah. New ideas are coming from, you know? Yeah, man, that's, they, and, and it's funny because you talked about Brandy Carlisle, who was the artist that my client looked at her stream to see if it was, uh, if it was technically okay. And it was so solid and so professional that we decided we'll go on Veeps too. Mm -hmm. Because as much as we want to, you know, think that this is easy, it isn't. And if you look at the John Krasinski video, which looks like it was uh, done on Zoom, it wasn't. So, you know, as managers, we want our artists to look and sound as good as they can so that in the houses, you know, on your computers, on your phones, you're getting you're getting something that you're happy with, that you'll sit there for an hour and listen to. And so, you know, great technology is out there. It's just not everywhere. Yeah, and I think it's uh, what you all are saying too, and what we've all been saying is some of this might have been discussed and thought about. I know even in my older times, uh, when we would do shows and we thought about, you know, simulcasting from a venue. And a lot of times there was hesitancy about, you know, we don't want to replace the live experience. We always want the fans to be able to want to come. But, you know, like I think, Kevin, you particularly mentioned it, when you're kind of forced into this situation, you have to look at these new areas and all at once you realize they're pretty good. 
So as we go back to whatever that go back is, it sounds like there'll be more opportunity than there ever was for some of the folks who want to work in our industry. I, I, I absolutely think so. I think, you know, you're also going to see a dynamic shift because when we talk about artists going back on the road and crews going back on the road, one of the things I've brought up is you're talking, you know, the demographic of a lot of our artists now and touring crews are starting to hit that demographic that is, is at risk. If we're talking about what they say over 60, right. we have artists that are touring that are 60s, 70s into almost their 80s now. And mm -hmm. if there's an artist touring in that level, tends to be a lot of their support staff would fit into that demo. Right. So a lot of people are going to question, should I go back out on the road? Oh yeah, it's amazing how many people called me and said, how do I become a teacher in the past six, six, <laughs> six or eight weeks, you know? Um, and I'm like, so, so there'll be a lot of opportunity for a younger demographic that won't fit, that, that'll fit that health um, profile possibly. Um, you know, it's also gonna disperse our business. Our business, just like in technology, if you're looking at the, the migration from Silicon Valley for technology, our business now is going to spread out. There's gonna be opportunities to live anywhere in this country and be able to find work because the crowded office spaces or the need to gather in one spot is, is we're talking about in business in general is going to change. So that dynamic of having to move to LA or New York, you know, what the LA or Nashville, let's say, Nashville being that base, not so much New York now, is going to change. So, um, you know, huge upheaval <laughs> causes great, opportunity if you if you can relax that's the biggest thing right now the 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 internal stress we're all having the anxiety we're having to be able to separate yourself from that and just be able to look at the larger picture uh, we're seeing the the event you know the uh, neva i think the independent clubs that are all working to stay in business right now i'm starting to tell i was telling them you guys have a big opportunity two years down the road here, you could change this business right now again, back to a, a control of an independent world, uh, because no offense against Live Nation, I know we got Live Nation on I'm here. not liking this, I'm But sorry. you know, you know me, Morgan, I'm always, I'll talk about anything. It, <laughs> is there, there's going to be, there's cracks in, all over there that people can mm -hmm. slide in and build a niche again. Where Live Nation, we just looked at it, the dominance in some ways. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I like that Michael Rapino is telling everyone, you're going to need to go on some sort of door deal situation with them. Warp Tour was a door deal for all but two years of the Warp Tour. We were a door deal. We earned our money when we went out. We, were, we didn't have a giant gang. We earned it. So you know what? Artists are going to have to choose. And that's going to put a lot on the artists and the management to work just as hard as they expect Live Nation marketers where you guys are so overworked and understaffed. I've been a, a big vocal component of yours, Morgan, that you don't <laughs> have enough staff. Um, that, you know what, it's gonna, it's an equalizer. The mm -hmm. agencies are going to change. Um, everyone's off their high horse now. There's no one can be on their high horse in this business. And even that, even that being said, you know, just on the Live Nation bit is, you know, we're, we're based off of entre entrepreneurial spirit. So if you are a local promoter and you're, you're making a splash, I mean, chances are you'll be joining us. I mean, we have, we have that happening, you know, right here in Pittsburgh where, you know, local, local promoter, Josh Bakaitis, you know, he has, we've been watching him for years. Um, he wanted to come over to Live Nation for stability and then hopefully, you know, back what was this? It feels like a lifetime ago, but a few months ago, you know, we're breaking ground on, a, on the Civic Arena site you know, for, for a new Live Nation venture there. So it's, it's all really exciting, um, you know, and it's, it's all possible. Whatever you dream up to do right now, it can turn into something much bigger. So the advice, the advice to the students, would it be to uh, just be looking for these opportunities, guys? Or is there anything special that, other than us trying to maybe teach some of this, I mean, how else would they get this in this technological world that we're looking at for these visual type things what, what should they be looking for hey Stuart, what's your great skill your great skill set Stuart, right now is in huge demand what were you originally on Lollapalooza? tell them you were the original accountant well yes because you know i started in this business as a roadie and then became a tour manager and then kind of figured out what tour accounting was 
and I, I was able to figure out the dynamics between the financial relationship between the promoter and the show. And, you know, I, I had a, a good career doing that. So, yeah, understanding how the money flows and what the business relationship dynamics are between a promoter and an artist and who all the shareholders in any particular deal are was kind of invaluable. But at Lollapalooza, we made it up as we went along because at that point, that business model didn't exist. Good points, really good points. You know, you, well, there's so much for our students to be thinking about and uh, this has probably brought a lot to their minds. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up soon because I want to get some questions in because I know kids have questions. But one thing I thought I'd maybe wrap up by saying, and we were just talking about this when you guys got on the phone uh, early because you're in L.A. and all the craziness going on. Any feedback or any just thoughts on, um, you know, the situation with uh, the Black Lives Matter and what they did yesterday? Uh, just feelings in general, where we're headed and what we should be thinking about as we have all kinds of different students that do go to school with us? Well, Ed, Ed I'm just going to say, you know, and, and it's been strange for me because, you know, and, and this goes back to 1991 Lollapalooza. We had a gentleman named Ice-T that came on that tour. We, I became very close with Ice-T on that tour. Mm -hmm. And the next year we had Ice Cube come out. And, and Ice Cube, you know, he had, a, he had very strong beliefs and he wasn't so happy that I was the a white stage manager. And, and Ice-T flew up to San Francisco. We rehearsed that year. And he came to that show special and he introduced me and he said, I want to introduce you to Kevin. Um, he's colorblind. He just sees ignorance. And I think the ignorance is coming to a point in this country and I think we all are going to be standing up right now. And we, we have, I've always felt I've stood up. I mean, when people, I saw someone saying we need people of color. I mean, I, I hire, you hire the best people and I've hired every ethnicity based on their, their skill sets. And, and, you know, I believe, I believe this is a wake up call for our country. Um, and, and I said it before, you, you have to get to the severity and you know, who knew, you know, a pandemic, you know, I thought when Trump, like, how bad could this get? I thought he'd get us into a war. No one could ever thought pandemic. And, you know, I thought we would end up in some random war. We have now hit a crisis point in this country where we all better wake up. And the one great thing you guys will have when you tour, when you learn how to go on the road, is you will learn, you'll be going to truck stops, you'll be flying around the world, you will get out of this country. You know, there was no reason to make America great. It is a great country. We have inherent problems. They're just coming to fucking the forefront right now. And, and it's, and it's going to be. And, I'm, and we fought for this for so long. We really have. And through, you know, we don't do the giant benefit shows. We, we used to do a benefit show a week in L.A., you know. <laughs> Stuart remembers, and I produced, you know, the first rock, first uh, rock the Vote show, the Rock for Choice shows. I produced every benefit show in L.A. there ever was. And now we need to get back not only as an industry, but as a country and stand up and stand for something. I think we were so scared that for one bad comment on social media that someone might say about us, or it's one thing, you know, and we're just going to, we're going to have to really, really buckle down. And, and I think, you know, you have to see this. People are pissed. Right. Stuart, any thoughts on that? Or Morgan, please. We wrap up? Uh, you know, it's, it's, a as Kevin eloquently said, this is a very interesting time. I mean, um, uh, I remember the days of benefit concerts and, uh, you know, now, artists have the opportunity to say what they feel on social media and not have to stand in front of an audience of 3,000, 10,000 people to say what they feel. So that's, uh, that's kind of uh, uh, changed things a bit. But uh, every artist I work with is supporting the protest now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got you there. Yeah, I remember, I think I even saw something online that uh, you guys were doing, you know, so it was interesting. Morgan, any thoughts? Everybody, 
essentially the entire industry yeah. shut yeah, down was, yesterday. We definitely did a blackout yesterday at Live Nation. Everybody had out of offices up, I'm sure. If you guys were on social media yesterday, you saw the blackout posts. Um, I think, you know, just to bring it full circle with just humanity, you know, as much as I'm a marketer to my core and I'm on socials a lot, you guys can take a step back from those and put your phones down for a little bit. Um, and then, you know, I'm in Pittsburgh. A lot of us are in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, channel your in inner Mr. Rogers and talk to your neighbors. I, I did that. I walked to the office yesterday to do some cancellation ad packs. And, you know, I talked to my neighbors, face mask on, six feet apart, but I actually got to go out and see people. And I think that that's what helped me the most. You know, the news choppers overhead are trying to chime and trying to bring your energy levels down and, you know, just beat you over the head with news. Um, but I think that the real humanity is, is right next door to you. Yeah. Um, and I think that we just need to talk to our neighbors. Just like you would at a concert, just like you would feel a connection with somebody as soon as your favorite artist goes on to the show, you can do that in your neighborhoods about the place that you live. Make Very it beautiful, add. talk to your people. Yeah, yeah Kev. Add. One yeah. of the things I, wanna, I just posted up, but one of the things we can do as an industry, and I've done it on every tour I've ever produced, um, I donate 25 cents a ticket mm -hmm. to uh, social causes, to music cares that helps our industry. Right. I've been an advocate for that for. 20 something years now of producing my own events, 25 years of producing my tours. Yep. Um, may not sound like, but it adds, up. Mm -hmm. it adds up. And I was there and when we shut this business down, there was immediately all these roadies and all these crew people out of work. And if people had listened and to be 100% honest, the agencies blocked it from, I know artists went and did it. It was that artists would have to fight for this. I said, our industry should be donating 25 cents a ticket. We have fees for everything. Right. 25 cents a ticket should have gone into a pool knowing that our artists don't have health insurance. They don't have a safety net. They don't have this type of thing. Think how much would have been in that top pool right now to take care of our own. Mm -hmm. And maybe this will be the time that we have to learn how to take care of our own. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's, a, it's a definitely an eye-opening experience. And I think that's what we're going to hear from everybody. Listen, before we wrap up, uh, I'd like to bring Christy back in, uh, our co-moderator. And uh, Christy, uh, we have probably, well, we're really probably a little over time, but I'd like to ask, have some of the questions asked if we did have some. So are there some questions maybe you uh, could read that maybe direct to one of them or just generically or fire away? Oh, well, let's unmute her though, uh, Mr. Durda. I'm unmuting, yes. Oh, you're unmuting. Christy, you're unmuting. Thank, thank you. Okay. Um, so we have a great question here from Professor Paige Beal. Um, and she asked, what should our students be doing now to get involved in understanding technology of virtual events? So like what you all were talking about since events are moving, could be moving towards like a more virtual setting. Uh, what do you all recommend for us students to move forward with that? Anything specific, guys? I mean, you went through a lot of generic things, but maybe, and there isn't any maybe more of a specific, but if there is, please chime in. Well, management companies, you know, there's, there, there's still a lot of virtual internships out there. So, you know, there are opportunities. I mean, labels are hiring right now. Actually, it's a very interesting time because labels are weathering this better than anyone at this point because labels had gone to almost all digital. Everyone that works at a label is digitally focused pretty much. There's, very, there's a little bit of retail, but not much, you know? Right. So, so I know people that labels that are bringing in interns. There's companies like Black Box out there um, that I was able to put a lot of students into for the summer because they're doing a lot of virtual marketing for people. So sometimes an artist is like, now they're looking at it going, okay, we're doing this online event. We need to spend a little money against this to make sure we maximize our thing. So we're going to an outsourcing some of our marketing for that. Cause you know what? Our management companies aren't really set up for that yet. So there are little niche marketing companies, labels, okay. Okay. companies directly. Okay. So you know, there's three or four avenues that you just have to kind of, Go in there and start seeing where these are popping up and, and reach out to them. LiveX Live, which was kind of a company that was on the fringe, is starting to do really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're really busy right now. Um, Connect TV that I used, I moved, I pivoted the 320 Festival, which was supposed to be all based on mental health awareness and education. 
We were doing it at LA Live. It was going to be a live event on May 9th. My students were producing it with me. Uh, we were going to do 7,500 to 10,000 people for this free event. That's what we expected. Mm -hmm. We pivoted it online. And by investing a little in marketing, we ended up doing 126,000 people over wow. this. Now, wow. um, you know, I'm, at, I'm launching now. I'm pivoting all my building of projects are for the next 8 to 12 months because I'm not worried about live. I can't even think about it right now. I'm pivoting everything I'm doing to how will I building platforms and working with platforms to build awareness. So eventually when the time is right, maybe there is a live component to it, but not thinking about it yet. Not right now. Yeah, good. No, that's great. Uh, thank you. Christy, another question maybe? Yes. Um, I know that we have a lot of students on this call and a lot of students who have recently graduated or are about to graduate and I know you all had the advice of looking into doing things virtually but do you have any more advice for students who are searching for jobs like right at this moment and what they can do anything more um, you know it's interesting because this ties into the question that you know uh, just before this uh, about streaming and those type of events. This all revolves around marketing, right? I mean, if we uh, learned our skills in the live event field, uh, the skills right now are when you're doing uh, a streaming event, the artist is their own promoter. And so, uh, understanding how to market and how to get the word out without having the traditional leaning on the promoter model to do this is gonna be really important. And a lot of these streaming companies and companies that are, are uh, pivoting their platform to entertainment streaming, at my management company, I see it go through the marketing people first. So, you know, uh, go heavy on marketing knowledge is my uh, my suggestion. And, and I would just piggyback off of that as a marketer um, for a promoter. Um, you guys can all go get Google certified right now. You can you can go online. You can figure out how to get Google certified. Um, research OTT streaming. Kevin was just talking about streaming TV. How do I get ad placement on Hulu? How do I get reach an Xbox consumer? You know, dig into all of that stuff and. I would say, you know, as much as we get so granular focused on I want to be in production, I want to do this, I want to do that. How do you market anything? You know, my dream used to be Heinz ketchup. And then I just fl fluttered in all the different artists. You know, I get to market Lady Gaga and then Warp Tour and then, you know, Donny Iris, like all in one week. So like, how do you just be a full encompassed marketer? There's a lot of things that you can do. Um, with all the time that we have right now, you know, I know people don't like when you say that, but you can you can take a couple hours out of your day to jump on Google and get certified in YouTube, especially, you know, the video is cumbersome. Um, but as soon as you get certified in, in Google video, I mean, you're good to go. So that is such great advice, Morgan. And, you know, with that, you know, we like, I'm sure Kevin does the same thing. We do tell our students, you know, you gotta, you gotta reach out, you know, you gotta do, mm -hmm. we can do so much on our behalf as uh, mentors or teachers or call us whatever, but uh, we're fortunate that most of our students are go-getters. And I think that's one thing we all found that we were, and that's why we're prom promoting it to them. Christy, maybe one more question. Sure, um, we have a question from Melissa just now. Um, and she asked, what is one thing that you all have learned or a skill that you have developed through these challenging times that you never thought of before and that would still be beneficial once all this is over and back to normal? I'll take that immediately. Mine is meditation. Everybody talks about it. Everybody says it's a good tool. Um, I never used it every single day. Um, I only used it whenever I would get frustrated and need to walk away from an email. But now, you know, I work it into my morning routine and it's it's insane how different your your brain works whenever wow. you meditate every single day. That's great. That's sure. great. Anything uh, in the Stuart Ross area? Man, I got to tell you, you know, the skill when I first kind of figured out where I was going to go in this industry 
was was understanding numbers. Yeah. And it still has really served me well. Yeah. Because you know, it's the it's the one part of understanding the dynamic relationships between all of the parties in a con in the concert industry is invaluable. And so learn about deals, learn about how promoters and agents and managers and artists make money. Totally. Yeah. And I appreciate you even saying that because that's so much a part of our programming and we have those kinds of things in our live entertainment classes and production tour management classes, because, you know, all we're trying to do again, I'll speak probably for people like Kevin and I and, and any others that are at Belmont or wherever, we're just trying to take the experience that we've had over the years uh, and bring it to the students, you know, and Stuart, you'd be a phenomenal professor out there in your spare time. You might want to call <laughs> Professor Lyman and see if he can get you some part-time work over at USC. <laughs> Money's a little tight now. You might be able to use a few bucks, you know. That's right. Hey, hey Kevin, any last words there from you? Uh, you've done it all, I mean, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I, you know, what have I learned? I mean, for me, it was very strange because this was the first summer in 28 years that I did not, what you know, between going on Lollapalooza and then starting my own festivals in, in, in 1995, Trust me, I got a lot of calls like, how did you know to end last summer? <laughs> and because it, to think about, I would have been going on sale on April 1st was our normal on sale date. Um, so I guess timing, um, I would love to just say that, you know, for me, it's, it's, you know, I've never changed. And I'm the same person. Anyone knows me that I've been now working in the business almost 40 years. I've never changed. You don't have to mold yourself for this business. You'll be told that you need to do this, you need to act. I was told I need to dress a certain way or I need to live a certain way my life and everything. And I've never changed. And I, maybe that goes back to that punk rock world I grew up. Uh, I've learned how to adapt because if you don't adapt it to this business, but adaption and change are two different things. Just you know, so I, I don't really think I've changed. I'm still the same person. Get up and I go work in my garden and I talk on the phone. I do phones. But I've also just kind of learned that, you know, I, this is kind of, you know, this is a really exciting time. I'm too old to probably be, you guys are going to be in the mix. You guys are going to take over right now. Right. Uh, because to be honest, I don't know if I have that energy that I would say I had when I was 20 years old, 19 years old, starting to put on shows. Yeah. Um, I like to say that, but you know what? I put my heart and soul into this business and I'll find ways. And now I put it into my students and right. they're stoked. They put on a festival for 120 something thousand people online and we're able to pivot in, a, in five weeks from a live event to an online event. And you know what? Their knowledge of technology and my just let's get it done. Like me, I just said, look, I didn't even know how we were going to get it done at first because, you know, that, it was just kind of the rough start. We had just got told we were going to teach on Zoom. I had to learn. We had to learn this. And all of a sudden I'm saying we're going to take 21 hours of programming online. We had over 40 artists on as part of this event. <laughs> Guess what? You did it. You know? It came off yeah. pretty flawless. People were pretty stoked. <laughs> Morgan? Yeah, and I think that's the beauty of the industry is nobody knows how it's all going to come together. You you have a vision and you have passion and you have energy and then it just does, you know. So anybody that's just graduating right now, you might not know or maybe somebody's not hiring or whatever. You just have to believe that it works out because it honestly does. It and all just comes full circle. And if you're interested in any of these mental health panels we did, um, they were focused all over from LGBTQ plus to uh, we're, um, to ethnic um, situations and mental health to, we had 20 something panels. So if you're looking for them, it's called the 320 Festival. I did it with Talinda Bennington. You can find anything on now YouTube or Facebook. You can watch any of those panels. We had an amazing, I see someone's using Headspace. They were involved. Mm -hmm. um, it was a pretty, some people said, well, how did you time that well? I said, I didn't time my mental health festival to come out right in the middle of a pandemic. So uh, you just got to get out there and do it, you guys, and, and be willing to fail. That's okay. It's failures. This is a great time because we're all figuring it out all over again. So failure is okay. <laughs> like, totally accept it. Well, those are all great points, guys. You know, and, and we're going to wrap up because uh, I promised you would be at around 12. But I really appreciate you guys coming on, all of you. Um, I was I so I tried to select you know the people that I thought would be great for these people and uh, I know I did the right thing and and all of you uh, 
have so much to offer. And, uh, you know, and Kevin, you've been there, you know, from the beginning, you're always giving back. And now I say with the teaching, that's been phenomenal. Uh, Stuart's been, I, I can, what can I say? Uh, you know, when, when we got the Kelly Weiss story and not only that, but just anytime he's been asked, you know, and, and I know you guys are busy. I mean, you know, and, but it wasn't just now that you've done it. You've done this when I've come along and asked you because, you know, I'm fortunate that a lot of my friends are still working in the business. And when I first told them what I was doing, you know, it's like, I'm teaching. They go, what the heck could you teach? I go, wait a minute, what's that supposed to mean? You know, because really entertainment management and business and things like that has not really been at the forefront, but we all see it coming a lot further. And a lot of our kids are great. They're working in LA and Nashville and New York and Pittsburgh and, and they're motivated. And we're trying to keep them motivated because we know that we're still interested. And, and, and even though we might be getting in that same, uh, well, I'm probably I past your category, Kevin, but uh, you know, we're still interested in giving back. So again, you guys in LA, particularly, thanks for getting up early, Morgan, I'm going to see you on a bike ride sometime soon. Then we'll go to La Prima to have coffee. Uh, listen, I'm going to let everybody go, but I wanted to mention before we go, next week it's a ticketing session with Mr. Jason Varnish. Uh, Jason, of course, used to work at PPG Paints Arena, a ticket uh, box office manager, and now he has his own company. And he's got uh, three or four phenomenal panelists from all over the United States, including the Staples Center, et cetera. So that's next Wednesday. We're going to continue to have these. You'll see those types of things. And I lastly wanted to say that if you are any SAM people or really anyone in general that want to stick around, uh, the staff uh, from uh, Point Park here, we're going to stay online just to see how you guys are doing while we let our panelists and anybody else go. So again, thanks a lot, everybody, for coming on, especially Stuart, Kevin, and Morgan. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, guys. Stay Goodbye. safe, everybody. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, Thank take you. care. Okay. Uh